Good morning, everyone. If we could take your seats, we'd like to get started. I'd like to welcome you today to the 2024 Innovate New Mexico Technology and Startup Showcase. I first want to start by thanking our sponsors today. As many of you know, this is a group effort among the state's research institutions, and we're grateful for the partnership that we all have and the sponsorship that many provide to the event. Our sponsors include Lanol's Feynman Center for Innovation, Sandia National Laboratories, the New Mexico Economic Development Department, the Arrowhead Center at New Mexico State University, the Arrow. Port America. Thank you all. This event wouldn't be possible without your support. So I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, and our speaker is Acting Cabinet Secretary Mark Roper. <laughs> I learned things from this bio, so I will read it to you. Mark is the Acting Cabinet Secretary for the New Mexico Economic Development Department since January 2024. Roper is a seventh generation New Mexican with a long background in media, marketing, and public service at both the state and community levels. He joined EDD in 2014 as a community, rural, and business development representative and was named division director for economic development in 2019. In addition to his work in economic development, Roper was a licensed electrician and HVAC mechanic and worked in radio marketing and communications. So if something happens with our AV this morning, we know who to call. <laughs> he also served as an elected city official in Raton and on the New Mexico Municipal League Board of Directors. At EDD, Roper has been involved in boosting development along New Mexico's international border plex. He has helped recruit companies to New Mexico from Germany, Taiwan, Singapore, and Australia, and has been involved in some of the agency's biggest deals, Facebook, Intel, Netflix, Universal Hydrogen, Maxim, Welcome. That made me sound way better than I am. It also shows you that I'm a kind of a jack of all trades. I don't think I've mastered any of them. But thank you for having me here today. Uh, Lisa, Cara, and your team at New Mexico Rainforest. Not only thank you for having me here today in this opportunity, but thank you for what you do for New Mexico and for what you do for the university. You know, it's interesting how New Mexico uh, is once again now in the national spotlight with one of our key industries. And Oppenheimer is going to keep New Mexico in the spotlight as we move into the Academy Award season. And it is a good time for New Mexico. I, I know when we're here, sometimes we don't always think of film and media as being technology. But it, as that happens, it's an opportunity for us to put New Mexico in the forefront for the land of innovation. Oppenheimer was part of that innovation that happened here in New Mexico. And he stood at the forefront of that innovation from Los Alamos to the White Sands Missile Range. And, uh, you know, innovation has been a long history in New Mexico, even starting with a guy by the name of Goddard that uh, did a few rocket launches of his own uh, down around Roswell. Today we have innovation happening 
all across the state, but it's very specifically in our three national labs, Los Alamos uh, National Laboratory, Sandia National Laboratory, and the Air Force Research Lab, continuing to do the type of work that is innovative. And then we look at our research universities, New Mexico State University, and of course UNM, uh, and their, their work, along with New Mexico be one of the top STEM areas because of those research in, in institutions. And let me tell you a little bit about the Economic Development Department, because that's where I'm from. Uh, we're, when I came to the department, and, and my bio was wrong, I came in 2011 uh, as the regional rep. We didn't even have a science and technology department. That's amazing. In New Mexico, the land of innovation, in 2011, the Economic Development Department did not have an Office of Science and Technology. Think about that. Shortly after that, luckily, um, we did get an Office of One uh, that is the Science and Technology Department. And we've been lucky enough in recent history to be able to grow that a little bit. And I want to pause for a moment and talk about the head of our science and technology department right now. It is the uh, strategies, science and technology. And I want Nora Sackett to stand up. I know a lot of you know her, but for those that don't, uh, get, to, get to know Nora. Uh, currently, we have three positions now in the Office of Science and Technology. Uh, we have the Director of Science and Technology and we also have a newly created position last year called the Entrepreneurship uh, Coordinator. Now, that's going to lead into some really exciting news that came out of this past legislative session. Uh, thanks to some innovative legislators, uh, and I'm going to specifically call out Vice Chair Meredith Dixon for her vision into the energy, uh, climate, and the science and tech uh, area. She fought hard to get to expand what we call the strategy of the science and technology department by probably three more people. And we're also going to be able to do some really significant data gathering and research to truly create a business plan for us on the direction of science and technology and the building a business for the basics of economic growth in New Mexico and truly diversify our economy for probably the first time since 1912. Uh, it's a pretty exciting time and I think it's going to be uh, really important uh, as we move forward, working on those things such as venture capital and helping our small entrepreneurs uh, grow and learn how to be business people and keep that technology here in New Mexico. Of course, you heard in the bio that we've done, we, we have done some pretty significant things. The Intel expansion, Maxion, the largest project in New Mexico in 40 years. That's huge. It's a $2 billion project that's going into Mesa del Sol. It's a first case of reshoring in the solar industry, thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act. But it is exciting news because that, that single announcement even though we don't even have a shovel in the ground yet, he's already gotten us four additional new leads from foreign companies and domestic companies looking to expand into New Mexico simply because of that announcement. It's exciting times here in New Mexico. You know, New Mexico researchers, they do a great job. We, we have, as everybody's been well known, a very significant number of PhDs. But we also have a significant number of patents that are developed here in New Mexico. We just haven't done a really good, and this is straight honesty, we haven't done a really good job of keeping those patents in New Mexico. Think about it, we had zero in 2011. And hopefully by fiscal year 2026, which will be the next legislative session, that'll be an office of eight. So that's exciting times as far as I'm concerned here in New Mexico. 
So, you know, I talked a little bit about Oppenheimer and um, the importance that that film has to, in talking about innovation in New Mexico, but it also helps New Mexico get on the map as it was filmed here. And we'll be able to take advantage of that from a marketing perspective and continue uh, to promote New Mexico. The film also teaches us about the uh, resiliency. And, uh, you know, I think we know a little something about resiliency in New Mexico as we've seen the booms and busts of our extractive industries, uh, industries, as I say, uh, as I grew up in Raton, as you heard, um, there used to be a coal mine up there that employed 650 people. Um, and it's no longer exists. Uh, and it wasn't because of any nefarious things or even climate. It was simply a matter of economics. Uh, they couldn't mine that coal as cheap as they could in other places. And ultimately, the place uh, they chose to close the mine simply over economics. Uh, but that being said, I directly experience in seeing what happens when that leaves. I was the fool that got into economic development after the coal mine closed. Uh, I mean, that kind of shows you how smart I was. But anyway, as we look toward the future, as we look towards changing our industries from extraction, as we look to the future of new energy, you know, it's important to look at the things that we have and our advantages. The spaceport of Mary. And I know you didn't come to hear me talk, so I thank you for this opportunity. But now it's my honor uh, to introduce your keynote speaker. Now, Doug Campbell knows a thing or two about innovation. And he grew up here in Albuquerque, the product of Albuquerque Public Schools. And I emphasize public uh, because sometimes uh, New Mexico gets a bad rap and sometimes that's justified. But truth of the matter is, a lot of really intelligent, smart people have come out of New Mexico to become engineers, doctors, lawyers, and, and great school teachers, et cetera. Uh, so coming from the New Mexico public school, Cibola High School graduate, Doug, he told the UNM newsletter, I found this funny, that you probably wouldn't have found him studying when he was going to Cibola. He would most likely have found him skateboarding and getting chased off by the police because he was skateboarding someplace he wasn't supposed to. Uh, but that didn't stop him from uh, going on to his hometown university, University of New Mexico, where he received both his bachelor's and master's degree in mechanical engineering. There he was able to tap into mentoring and research at, at AFRL. And he also told the UNM newsletter that he practically grew up on the UNM campus. While his mother herself putting herself through college and earning a degree in civil engineering. Doug uh, left New Mexico to pursue his professional passions and was instrumental in guiding two Colorado startups. One in the next generation rechargeable EV batteries and another in low earth orbit satellites. Doug has been named the most admired CEO by the Denver Business Journal. He has $5 million pledge to help create the Gerald May Department of Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering is his largest ever for the School of Engineering. Doug returned here to Albuquerque in 2023 and is now an active investor in the Colorado and New Mexico startup ecosystems and serves on multiple boards. Even with his entrepreneurial work, the most interesting part of Doug's LinkedIn biography is professional recreationalist. He spent a few years as a professional mountain biker Doug will tell you that starting a business and being a professional athlete have a lot in common. Both involve a lot of risk, hard work, and uncertainty. And it is without a doubt my pleasure to introduce Doug Campbell.
Ah, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Note of clarification, my degrees are from civil engineering, not mechanical engineering. <laughs> so, um, uh, Lisa, thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity. Um, I've been out of the saddle for, uh, oh, there we go. I've been out of the saddle now for 18 months. I stepped down as CEO of Solid Power, gosh, end of uh, 2022. And it was really fun throwing this deck together. If for no other reason, I don't think I have touched PowerPoint in a year and a half. So I literally pulled up PowerPoint and it was like, ah, oh, my old friend. Wait, how do you crop photos? <laughs> so, so it was a, it was a lot of fun. And by the way, this so this image I, I posted on LinkedIn uh, that I was giving this keynote, and a friend of mine, Eric Abrahamson, who's in that image, sent me this photograph. And. Uh, I kept giving him a hard time about giving me a gift. So in my right hand there is a, Macall a bottle of Macallan, 18-year-old, uh, really, really nice scotch. And then he showed up with this unicorn outfit. He made me put it on. And I think as many of, as many of you have gotten to know me, I, I use a lot of humor, so I'm not afraid to look like an ass. Um, and so, case in point. Um, I'm going to give, there we go. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about just one slide on how did, how did Doug get to uh, his entrepreneurial world. So yeah, Albuquerque kid through and through. Uh, went to uh, APS, class of 91, Cibola High School, go Cougars. Um, indeed, pretty much in high school, I did two things. I partied and I skateboarded. Um, as this, this is literally the only image I have of myself skateboarding. Um, I would like, this would have been circa 88, 89 probably. And I'd like the record to reflect that I am skating in original Jordan 1s. So that's about as OG as it gets for, for skateboarding. Uh, spent two years goofing off post high school. Um, again, I was deficient education-wise, so I had to go to CNM. It was TVI at the time. I had a phenomenal experience. Um, and so now I'm starting to lean in at CNM. I've got a meeting with the president, Tracy, tomorrow to talk about all things sort of CNM. And then I slid over to UNM, um, because I did all my prereqs at, at CNM, I went right into the civil engineering department. And I just, it was a very seamless transition. I had just such a phenomenal uh, experience. One of my professors, Julie Coonrod, is here. She can attest to me being a decent student, I would like to think. Um, in addition to that, I was legitimately a student athlete. So now I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get heavily involved in, in UNM athletics. I spent some time with some of the football team towards the end of last season, just talking to them about my entrepreneurial journey. And I was really surprised at just how intrigued and they just passed. I slid over into to UNM. And I had a decent career. Um, it, was, it was fun. It's a tough way to make a living. And so at some point, I decided, you know what? Um, I probably ought to finish up that engineering degree and figure out what I'm going to do when I grow up. And so graduated with my uh, BS in 01, MS in 02, um, and then relocated to, um, uh, to the Denver area uh, to pursue, pursue initially a, um, an aerospace career. Pretty, I couldn't find a good image to capture that, but basically I spent uh, eight to nine years at two companies. They're basically just SBIR mills. Um, if, if, you know, if you don't know what that is, ask, ask me offline. It, but it was a great experience, but it was also very uh, unsatisfying, shall we say. Um, and so I got to, to the end of that, and I had one skill set in 2011. 2011 is when I punched out and said, I'm, I'm going off on my own. And that's, that skill set was very simple. I knew how to get money out of the federal government via the SBR program, but I was bound to determine that I was going to do it responsibly. Um, and that is essentially what turned into my two companies. So. Um, Literally, these companies started off, I, I shared an office with a couple of other uh, entrepreneurs, and we shared the rent, and that eventually gave birth to Rocor and, and Solid Power. The, those two companies were co-located all the way through 2016, so you can imagine you're hosting, let's say, GM, and you're looking at some sort of space deployable occulter, and they're asking strange questions. It's like, let's go talk batteries, guys. So that got kind of weird. So we had to we had to separate those companies. So these two photographs, the one upper is is our uh, opening up in Longmont, Colorado. I think that would have been 2016. And then down below, this was our second facility, rib, ribbon cutting, in uh, 20 I think 19 or maybe no. Okay. 
because they're, they're quite different, um, but all very interesting. To, to get to the punchline, we sold Rocor in 2020 uh, to uh, private equity back Redwire space. Uh, and then in solid power, I took them public on NASDAQ at the end of uh, 2021 and then did that for a year and then stepped down. There we go. Okay, real quick, Doug today. So I did, um, became an empty nester on the front range, uh, decided I was sick of Denver traffic. I'm an avid skier and mountain biker. I hate I-70. I wanted to get away from that place. And I wanted to come back to Albuquerque. The previous speaker made a comment about, hey, we make great IP. We make great patents. They don't stay here. That's my mission. That's why I'm here. I'm, I'm here to try to figure this out and see what we can do about it. Um, I am a part-time resident, so I split my time between two wildly different communities, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Gunnison, Colorado, which I refer to as God's country. Uh, come, to, come to Gunnison, especially in the summer. You're just going to look around, and it's just picture, picture perfect, postcard perfect. Um, in both places, I'm plugging in. And so you can see I'm, I am an active investor here in New Mexico. I'm an LP in two New Mexico-centric funds, Sarah Cap and the Vintage Fund. Um, up in Colorado, I've made direct investments as an angel investor in Agile Space Industries, which does in-space propulsion, and then Fortius Metals, which does uh, additive manufacturing. I'm a member of the Gunnison River Partnership, which is a collection of angel investors in the Gunnison Valley. I'm on the board of Exum, which is a uh, Denver-based company doing um, sort of next-gen mass spec devices. I'm also on the board of the NREL Foundation, so that's up in Golden, Colorado, and that's kind of cool because it helps me really keep a pulse of what's going on in the clean tech world. And then I love being outdoors. I'm a huge supporter of Gunnison Trails. But above all else, I love all things University of New Mexico. So I am on the board with uh, Jeff here at the foundation. Conference tournament next week, so looking forward to that. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I literally took three slides from each company, didn't touch them. So I pulled some decks, I have no idea who these were presented to, but I thought throwing them up there so you could see literally what we were talking about, I didn't change any of the words, but basically Rocor was a, we called it a team first company. We did not raise a single dime of equity money, which is really fascinating and I contend you can do that with a space company. If you don't believe me, come find me afterwards and I'll, I'll talk you through. Um, when we, so this would have been, I don't even know the date of this, so let's just say 18, 2018, 2019, um, we, what, essentially what we did is we started on SBIRs and then we quickly moved into uh, products for both commercial and defense. At that time, you have to realize that space was changing. Historically, space was these very expensive, you know, geo um, satellites that cost a billion dollars. Well, there was this thing called low Earth orbit and constellations starting to come about. A lot more risk tolerance, a lot more emphasis on low cost, which was historically not, not the case. And we, we basically rode that wave and did it completely non-dilutive. I think when we sold our headcount, I think it was pushing what it says on this slide, which is 75. Um, and so as I like to say, think of, a, think of a satellite as a box. That's your bus structure. Houses your payload, whatever the, re, you know, houses the reason why you're in space to do whatever it is you want to do. And then there's a bunch of crap hanging off that satellite. That's what we did. We did the crap. We, we, I called ourselves the picks and shovels of the satellite industry. So RF systems for communication, solar for power, booms for doing whatever it is you want to do. That's essentially what we did. Um, we were very much worldwide. Um, and so when I handed, I was actually CEO of both of those companies through the end of 2018. That's a lesson, never do that again. Um, I handed it over to gentlemen from the U. It was a really fun ride. Um, by the way, as I go through this presentation, I'm going to start littering different lessons that I picked up throughout my career. SBIR. So this is an article that I authored, gosh, five or six years ago in Venture Beat, um, where I talked about the strengths of, of SBIR, but I also talked about it's a program that's, that's ripe for abuse. And what I mean by that is there's these, we call them SBIR mills, and there's basically just these companies that sit there and they soak up all the SBIR money, but they never do anything with it. They just rinse and repeat. And man, I, A, I found that very dissatisfying, and B, I just have an ethical issue with that. That sucks. So I authored this article, and then I pulled the data from Rocor that shows all of the SBIR awards that we got, and this is in its entirety. This, I pulled this a week ago. Uh, that 
final bar is 2020. And you can see as a company, we did exactly what SBR was intended. We ramped up high water mark in 2019 was 6 million and then it plummeted after that. Not because the company wasn't doing great because we played through the program and graduated into actual true revenues. And so again, this is a lesson for, you can't do this with all companies, can't do this with a battery company. You can't bootstrap a battery company, gotta raise money. And as you'll find out, I raised a crap ton of money, but you can do it with other certain companies, but you gotta do it right. Um, some reflections on Roku. I called it a team first, 100% bootstrap company. And it absolutely was the case. We had such a phenomenal dynamic. You're looking at our three person board right before we, we exited. To my left is Will Francis, my co-founder. To my right is Chris Pearson, who I handed over the CEO role in 2018. And just the chemistry between us was, was absolutely phenomenal. So it, 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 you know, and when I say team first, what do I mean by that? The business model was quite simple. Okay, guys, we know space. We like each other. Let's do something. That was it. Department there, they were wrapping up some DARPA funded research and they're like, oh, we don't want to just pitch this over to tech transfer, we want to do something. And I had, I had developed some expertise in, in lithium ion batteries. Um, and so, uh, as I like to say it, I, there wasn't a lot of expertise, so I was sort of like the fastest tortoise, I think is how you're supposed to say that now. Um, but basically what that company is continuing to do is what's called all solid state batteries. So it's very simple, you replace the electrolyte, the liquid electrolyte with a, a solid ion conducting material, in all, our case a sulfide material. And that in and of itself isn't all that exciting, but it's really what it enables. It enables higher energy, new classes of chemistries, improved safety, because it's really the electrolyte that's the bad actor when we talk about abuse conditions. Um, and we did it in a manner in which we did not want to redo manufacturing. We, we absolutely had to ensure that it was a drop-in replacement for conventional lithium ion production, because had we not done that, there's absolutely no way we could have been successful because the, just the billions of dollars of capital that's been deployed around that industry. Us, us endeavoring to make that obsolete would have been a death sentence. Um, Strategic partners was a huge, huge part of, of what we did there. Um, OEMs, including BMW and Ford, we worked very closely with, but we also worked very closely with some other investors, Hyundai, Samsung, um, Solvay, Umicore, just kind of a who's who. And that was, that was pretty exciting. It was, it was interesting. I do have a lesson that I'll kind of talk about when it comes to how, how you work with strategic partners. So lesson two, if you want to be successful as a startup, you got to sacrifice. Let me give some context for this. So what you're looking at is, this is the page that captures Solar Power's ARPA-E award. That's what got us off the ground. It's a $5 million grant from ARPA-E back in 2013. Holy cow, talk about a shot in the arm. That's a lot of money for I'm writing a fucking proposal. So I'm, I'm, with, I'm traveling with Rocor. We land at DIA. I pull up my phone. Oh, there you go. I get an email from RPE that says, we're encouraging you to submit a proposal. I know enough about RPE to know that they do substantial down selection in the white paper phase. If you get an invitation for a full proposal, you damn well better write that and submit it. And then I thought to myself, oh shit, my family and I are going to Europe. Tough luck. So we got into a routine. We started in Amsterdam. I would get up early. I'd pound away. The family would kind of sleep in, then they'd go off and do something. They'd come back, bring me something for lunch. I'd pound away a little bit more. Then all of a sudden emails would come in from my guys at CU. That was my cue to, okay, I'm done for the day. Let's go goof off, usually three or four o'clock. And I did that for a solid week in Amsterdam. And then I did it for a solid week in Paris. And then I pressed that submit button from that, an apartment in Paris. Had I not done that, what you're about to see would have never occurred. And I don't think there's a lot of people out there that would have saw that award and been like, I'm going to Europe, screw that. No, you got to sacrifice. There's no nights and weekends. Um, okay, this is the wave. So, um, you know, in, in, in startups, when I tell entrepreneurs, I'm like, look, you, you can't ride the lows and you can't ride the highs. So in other words, you're going to have some dark times. Don't get too bummed out. You're going to have some exciting times. Don't get drunk on your own Kool-Aid. Um, 
but man, we got drunk on this Kool-Aid. So what you're looking at on uh, the left is these goofy little tombstones that bankers love to give out. Um, but it basically shows, holy cow, we went public, 550 million. On the right, you're looking at our, our uh, a PR of our last uh, price round at solid power. It says 130 million, that's not right. And remember, I'm an Albuquerque kid from, you know, Seville High School class of 91. So when I talk to kids, I'm like, man, you guys have the same tools I do. You could do this. Um, I did a quick back of the envelope calculation of an economic impact of a unicorn. So this is today, literally, the companies that I created, I roughly estimate there's about 400 jobs. There's right now on the front range. If, if I, I think I used an average salary of about 100K, maybe 110. It's about 45 to 50 million in unburdened payroll, and then you look at other economic activity, 50 to 75 million. That's pretty cool. The bummer is, that's Denver. That's not here. This is what we need to do here. Okay, some reflections on solid power. Um, I take a lot of pride in being from Albuquerque. The reason being is I like to say, when you're from Albuquerque, you can't get too full of yourself, right? I mean, we're a, we're a hardworking town, but we're not a hype town. And so one of the lessons I took is I went to the highest levels at BMW. This is me standing next to Frank Weber. He runs R&D at BMW. He's on the board of directors at BMW. So other than the CEO, it doesn't really get any higher than that. Cool guy. I don't stay in contact with him. You know who I stay in contact with? Those folks down on the right. Those are my people. Those were my champions. In, in the um, second from the right, that's Dr. Peter Lamb. He was in charge of all R&D was actually, he stepped down just a few months ago, all R&D for um, batteries and battery electrification for the BMW group. And then his, his right and left hand man, woman, Odie Pascos and Claudia Lentz, those were my people. Those were my champions. Never forget who brought you to the dance. Um, <laughs> this is a funny lesson. Uh, man, if you're gonna be an entrepreneur and you are literally in my case, I'd also like to point out the hair. It's all high and tight. That's not the case anymore. Uh, and you're going to have to pitch and pitch and pitch. And did I mention pitch? This is actually me. That's our current EPA director on the left. Um, and that's the head of BMW I Ventures in the middle. And as I jokingly like to say, that's my security behind me because, you know, <laughs> that's my marketing guy. <laughs> oh, and be good on TV. You know, it, it, I got to a point where you shove a camera in my face, and as long as I know what I'm talking about, bam, I can go. Uh, this is a photo of when I did uh, Mad Money with uh, Jim Cramer. Somebody, I think they put it up on the conference room at Solid Power. Somebody snapped a photo of it and texted it to me. I was like, oh, that's cool. Um, and more on TV, and this, this one's pretty funny. This was getting ready to, to do the closing bell at NASDAQ. Um, apparently, there's a... Um, uh, a ritual that the bankers who take you public the night before they they take you out to a really fancy dinner and they get you drunk and 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 you have to do it so far be it for me to you know uh, resist that but man the next morning I had to be ready to go I had to be ready to go um, I talked about strategic partners investors so this is I traveled to SK in Korea uh, to sign what has now evolved into a true licensing agreement that was announced just a few months ago. But this is me with the uh, VP of R&D signing that agreement. Strategic partners are very powerful, okay? They can be built in customers, they can be built in supply chain partners, and so on and so forth. The reason I say be careful is strategic partners always want something. There's always something. And that something can be very, very expensive. And at some point as a company, you, get, you run out of things to give away. And so it's this delicate dance when you work with strategic, because they really hate each other. And so you can play that off of them. Um, and so this, this was a culmination of a long, long negotiation with SK. Um, 
But man, I, I, these Asian companies, when they do ceremonies, they do it right. It's always a lot of fun. Um, don't forget about politics. Politics in business is extremely important. I had my lobbyist tell me, Doug, in politics, you're not a D, you're not an R, you're an I. And I'm like, I? Oh, independent. He's like, uh-uh, incumbent. I was like, oh, I get it. I get it. <laughs> uh, if we were up in Colorado, I probably wouldn't have to explain this picture. But what you're looking at is, um, that's Governor Polis in the middle. Uh, that's Joe Nagoose to uh, the governor's right, uh, who was our representative in the second district there in uh, Boulder County. And then at the time, that was our Republican senator, Cory Gardner. Um, and so I was really proud of this. We, we had this, this event, and it was bipartisan, and that's in business, it's bipartisan. That's how you have to do it. Um, and, and by the way, as an aside, Corey and Joe, great guys. Great, asking tons of great questions. Polis couldn't look more bored, just saying. Also, don't forget DC. Done a lot of walk in the halls on the Hill. I've done a lot of uh, congressional plus-ups that, that can also be very, very powerful. So as an entrepreneur doing startups, you, you cannot forget politics. Um, one of the things I did as part of this exercise is I dusted off some old blog posts that I used to run. Uh, before we got hot and heavy on the public stuff, we were doing some personal branding around myself. And a lot of it was, you know, musings of Doug, things that I've observed and things like that. And so this was a funny blog post. And I'm, I'm actually going to read the little paragraph down below. Quote, it was a cold, snowy winter day in Longmont, Colorado, and I was huddled with Rocor's CTO, Mark Lake, over a cup of coffee inside Rocor's aptly named coffee. Clearly implying what I definitely don't do is make batteries, which would be an obvious skill set for, for a battery company. And I very quickly sketched out this graphic here that I titled Things Needing Doing. By the way, trademark, I want to make sure everyone sees that. And I create a very simple pie chart because remember I'm an engineer, so I, I, need, I need charts and graphs and things like that. And I said, ah, yes, let, let me teach you, young Padawan. So there is this big sphere of things that need to be done for running a company. And then there's the little thing that I do. And, and over time, that little thing better get narrower and narrower as you grow. Because as an effective leader, you've got to start leaning on other people. I'm not an ops guy. Don't ask me to do ops. I'm terrible at ops. By the end of my tenure at Solid Power, you know what I was? I was a CEO. I was the chief handshaker and baby kisser. That's it. That's all I did. That's all I did. And that's part of the reason I stepped down. I got bored. We had all the money we needed. We had all the strategic partners we needed. If I brought in one more car company, my team would have mutinied on me. And so, so, so again, my advice to entrepreneurs, you got to focus. And you got to make a list of things you're good at and a list of things you're not good at. And if that list of things you're not good at is not considerably longer than the things you're good at, you're lying to yourself. Um, there we go. Ah, this is a fun one. Journalists are not your friends. Uh, let's see. So um, this on the left, you're looking at a, a Bloomberg article when I step down and quote, Campbell calls himself fish out of water at battery maker. No, Gabby, I didn't say that. And you're taking that out of context. Anyway, problem with journalists is you don't get to rebut. Uh, the second one, which I've actually embraced. So the daily camera is the local paper in, in Boulder. And this gal came over, and this was still when we were cohabitating the two companies. And she just kept grilling me. How long do you keep doing that? How long do you And I said, quote, I don't just want any old douchebag in here running the place, end quote. And when that came out, I was actually horrified. I was like, holy crap, Shay, I bet I dropped some F-bombs in that meeting too, and I don't see those quoted in there. Um, I've since embraced that quote uh, because I love it. And I embraced it so, and so by the way, journalists are not your friends. On the record, off the record, that means something. I wrote a blog post on what, what do you mean by that? And I, I, I coined this term, this term DEO, douchebag executive officer. We've all seen them. We've all seen them. What are they? They're extremely self-serving people. It's blatantly obvious what they're trying to do. And the problem is they, it is impossible to have any form of esprit de corps around your team when you have a leader like that who's so blatantly out for themselves. And so I used a few, by the way, love office space. I think it's a even though it's a bit dated, it's such a good reflection of, 
of kind of <laughs> the office dynamic. Um, you know, poster, poster child of DEOs is the, the old pharma bro. We can all remember him. And this might be controversial, but I got to tell you, man, Elon Musk, man, he is headed in that direction. That, to me, the, the kind, I mean, I love his genius. What he's done at Tesla and, and SpaceX is phenomenal. But what he's doing now with Twitter, X, whatever the hell you want to call it, it, it's like watching a slow-moving train wreck. And to me, it's an example of power corrupts. If you don't put people around you who can say, hey, let's back away from that send button just a moment and let's talk about that, that's, that's what happens. And, and, and so put a pin in it. Let's see what happens to uh, Mr. Musk. Lesson 11, I loved, I loved the international business experience that I got. Um, even just the customs. Uh, you know, I was talking with someone earlier, so I, I got in very deep. Man, the business culture over there is so, so different. Uh, we hired a postdoc, an American postdoc, out of a university in Germany. And it was so funny because I was asking him, I was like, hey, how's your German? He's like, terrible. I'm like, why? He's like, no one would talk German to me. And I'm like, well, that's weird. And he said, no, it isn't. You got to realize how Germans think. Germans' English is better than our English. Their grammar is perfect. And so a German, when they're talking to you and they hear your German, as an American, and they're like, oh, no, 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 no. My English is better than your German, therefore, we will be speaking in English. That's Germany. But I also love Germans because what you see is what you get. Oh, over in, in, so this is an image. I'm having dinner with some execs at Hyundai. I forget the significance. I, the way I'm pouring it is like showing deference or something. And then, by the way, that's soju. Be careful with soju. That gives you a wicked hangover. Um, so, so on the one hand, it was great with all those experiences, but man, every time I come back, I'm so thankful I'm an American. I mean, I am, I am a patriot through and through. And it's not that I didn't like what I saw. I definitely adopted certain things. You go over to Europe and you're like, huh, yeah, people kind of dress better around here. Yeah, maybe we Americans, before we put those socks and Crocs on, let's, let's, let's double think things. But yeah, a few too many rules. You go over to Asia, I mean, if you go, if you go to my house, I have Asian toilets, built-in bidets. First time I experienced one of those, I was like, oh my God, anything else is just barbarian. Uh, <laughs> but holy cow, the corporate culture, it is vertical. I don't understand how they get anything done. The permissions, the, it, it's just insane. And there's no entrepreneurial spirit. Why? Because they don't tolerate risk. If you stick your neck out and fail, your career's over. That's not the case in America. We embrace risk. And so, like I said, go. And I tell kids, go. Leap I'm an American. Don't ever forget your team. You're nothing without your team. You know, it goes back to that pie chart. Doug only does a little bit. That means I need a lot of people around me doing all that other stuff. And that's one thing I prided myself on is you do not ever forget your team. Um, this is, this is a, a small selection of the solid power team that we took with us um, to Times Square when we did the, the closing bell on NASDAQ. And then that was my team. That's part of my team at Roco. We're actually posing uh, the gentleman sitting to my left, he's actually a street artist. And so we brought him in. This is our conference room, and he did this phenomenal spray paint street artist thing. And so we posed with him uh, once he was, he was complete. Lesson 13, always have fun along the way. Again, I think most of you have figured out that I, I use a lot of humor. So um, let me explain what you're looking at here. So we were doing a photo shoot. This was our first dry room. Because um, in batteries, you have to produce them in a dry room. And, and I can't remember why we were doing a photo shoot that required me to, you know, get, a, get in a bunny suit. But anyway, we did. And I had this funny idea. I said, hey, guys, let's do a Kim Jong-un shot. So, you know, if you ever see Kim Jong-un, I, I don't know about you, but I laugh every time I see, because, you know, Kim Jong-un standing there and he's pointing and everyone's frantically writing down, like, what he's saying is, oh, so important. That's my Kim Jong-un shot. <laughs> okay. Final lesson, because I am an athlete, I'm avid skier, avid mountain biker. We need to wrap this up so I can get on the trail. Um, if you're going to succeed, you really got to send it. And what do I mean by send it? So in, in mountain biking, in, in skiing, you know, there are certain maneuvers, shall we say, where you can't hesitate. You can't, you know, you, you go up to that drop, you can't roll that drop. You got to send it. You got to fly. Otherwise, you're going to eat shit. 
Um, it's the same in business world. It, I had a lot of people that could have been my co-founders. They were unwilling to send it, meaning they were unwilling to do what I call somewhat of a do it, you're, you're not going to be successful. Okay, I thought I'd end with a little bit of a crystal ball. So what's, what's exciting to me right now? I still love space. Um, space is, is, it's, it is the next domain. It's the next domain for commercial. It's the next domain for military. Um, the New York Times did a great podcast last week on uh, you know, the current militarization of space. It's coming. It, it is coming. And so anything around um, you know, these, these, these constellation of satellites, both for commercial uses, communication. We also need competitors to Starlink and SpaceX. Remember what I said about Elon Musk. Um, I am just hugely excited about, about space. New, new launchers, new ways of, of propulsing things, new ways of reaching out and touching somebody. It's just it's phenomenal what's happening in space. OK, I'm not an AI guy. I was at an event last night, and I tried this out. And my guys started punching holes, and I was like, stop punching holes in my half-baked business idea. Um, look, we all see AI, right? It's coming. I bring nothing to the table on e AI. But what I am observing is AI is like an electrification moment. It's like the, when our society was electrified. That's what I see. Okay, I don't know how many more business opportunities there are, you know, the open AIs of the world, the anthropics, et cetera. I kind of feel like that ship may have sailed. So what... What are the picks and shovels of, of AI? And one that I came up with is regulation. I am both fascinated and horrified by AI because it, it, we need to do something. This, this is going to get crazy, and it's going to get crazy real fast, and we cannot rely on government. Government is not going to move fast enough. I believe, and don't punch holes in my half-baked business model, I believe there is a for-profit model out there around regulation. I don't know what it looks like. I'm not smart enough. But I believe there's something there. And then finally, Homer, I'm not an anti-fracking. We need it all. Because right now, all, you know, this state is awash with money thanks to oil and gas. Yay. Um, that's how our economy runs. But we have to transition to renewable and cleaner sources. Um, I do, you know, right now the market's not reflecting well on that. I believe it's temporary, my two cents. And, oh, look at that, 25 seconds to go. Oh, I have a plug, sorry. Um, I'm going to do a podcast. Uh, so I've, I've been going through some kind of fun personal branding stuff. And I feel like there's, I've been doing my research, and I feel like there's nothing kind of like what I'm thinking, which is literally leaders of enchantment, leaders of this state in areas of, Investing, startups, uh, general business leaders, higher education. Obviously, my connection to UNM is helpful, but I'd like to push out into some of our other institutions. And philanthropy. And, and the reason for something like this is we get a lot of negative news here in New Mexico. We need some positive news. We need some news around some of the cool stuff that's happening, and especially because I'm putting my money where my mouth is in terms of startups, angel VC investing, and, and philanthropy. And so it's, it's, it's still half-baked, so don't punch any holes in it. Um, but I, I'm going to do this, and I'm, I'm working with some various groups, both locally and nationally, to kind of get this thing off the ground, but stay tuned. Okay, now I'm done.